Welcome students to the next lecture of wireless communications. So <clears throat> in this lecture, we will start with uh, antennas. So every co wireless communication system um, comes with a transmitter and a receiver and at every transmitter and every reception device, you have an antenna to conduct the electrical signals okay so basically an antenna is an electrical conductor of uh, you know the signals and that uh, that uh, launches your electromagnetic waves of the signals into the space or into the air so in two-way communication the same antenna can be used okay so for transmission and reception so when we talk about antennas uh, the first thing that we need to uh, appreciate is the radiation pattern of the antenna okay and this defines the types of antennas as well so a radiation pattern is basically the graphical representation of the radiation properties of the antenna and often this is depicted as a two-dimensional cross-section so so i will come to this uh, this point in with the diagram in the next slide but before that let's uh, go through some of the um, other terminologies associated with radiation patterns so we have beam width or the half power beam width so this is basically a measure of the directivity of the antenna so again, uh, we will come to that in the next slide. Then we have the reception pattern, which is nothing but the receiving antennas equivalent to the radiation pattern. And then we have side lobes. These are basically extra energy in directions outside of the main lobe. We also have nulls. These are basically very low energy in between the main lobe and the side lobes. Okay. So, so let's see what a radiation pattern is. So this is what we mean by radiation pattern. So let's say your antenna is here and when you have a radiation pattern like this, a circular radiation pattern, it means that the antenna is propagating equal energy in all possible directions. Okay. So in other words, uh, the strength of the, of the signal or the power that the signal is carrying that is propagated from this antenna is same in all directions, okay? On the other hand, you can have a radiation pattern like this. So your antenna is located here and you have one main lobe like this, okay? and then you have side lobes like this as well okay so this means that this particular antenna in the middle is having a highly directional radiation pattern in this direction okay the, in this direction okay so so this is the beam width okay of the antenna as as i mentioned in the uh, last slide okay so this is the beam width uh, and then you can also define half power beam width where if this is the maximum power okay in this direction then whatever be the value let's say this value is x then at some point there will be x by 2 okay let's say this is the point where you have the power as x by 2 okay so so this is this is the point where you have x by 2 and this uh, this width is called half power beam width okay so <clears throat> whatever whatever be it is if it is a half power or full power beam width uh, the point is that this beam width actually determines the directionality of the antenna so this antenna is omnidirectional and it has equal beam width in all direction but this antenna which has a 
very highly directional beam in this direction uh, the beam width actually defines the directionality of the antenna so if you take the beam width for this side lobes these beam widths are relatively smaller compared to this beam width so the the antenna is mostly concentrating its power in this direction and you have you you can also see that there are some nulls so these 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 points where the power is almost zero okay this is one null this is another null and so on so these are the nulls of the radiation pattern all right so <clears throat> moving on there can be uh, different types of antennas based on the radiation pattern so you can have isotropic antennas which radiates power equally in all directions uh, these are also called omnidirectional antennas then you can have dipole antennas where again you have two types there you have half wave dipole and quarter wave dipole then you can have parabolic reflective antennas um, you can have directional antennas as i just mentioned uh, in the previous slide so <clears throat> the directional antennas are basically uh, arrays of antennas okay so many small antennas are, are arranged in an array like this okay and together all of these antennas together form a directional antenna okay so these small antennas may have uh, omnidirectional you know uh, power or radiation patterns okay but together with some phase and gain adjustment these these the omnidirectional patterns can form a highly directional pattern in one direction like this okay so we are not going to the details of how these things happen okay this is not a course on antenna theory but if you are interested you can you can explore more on the internet so so we can have directional antennas through arrays of uh, small antennas uh, where the signal amplitudes and phases uh, to each antenna are adjusted in such a manner that they create a directional pattern as I just said here and these are very useful in modern systems okay where you know in you, you want to have a very strong signal in one direction and, and, and you want to minimize the effect of interference from other uh, antennas so you can have these type of directional antennas so these are the examples of uh, some simple antennas so this is a uh, uh, this is both both these are dipole antennas so this one is half wave dipole and this is a quarter wave dipole so basically the concept here is that the length of the antenna is made equal to half the wavelength of the signal that it is emitting okay so let's say the electromagnetic wave that is that is emitting from this antenna has has a wavelength lambda so your length of the antenna is made half of that okay or or, or, or let's stick to the notation here let's say the wavelength is l and the length of the antenna here is made l by 2 Similarly, in this case, we have a quarter wave antenna where the length, the wavelength is L and you are making it one fourth of that. Okay. So, <clears throat> so these are uh, dipole antennas. Uh, and then uh, you can, you can also have radiation patterns in three dimensions. So, uh, you saw here that basically radiation patterns are graphical representation and usually they are depicted as two dimensional cross sections but you can also depict them in three dimensions so you can have the view of the radiation pattern from different directions so you can see it in the xy plane and have a side view like this 
you can also see it in the ZY plane and have a, have a view like this or you can have a top view from the XZ plane and it might look like this. So, so basically if you are looking from this direction, you can only see a circle that is the top view and then these are the different views from the ZY plane and the X, XY plane. Okay. So, and, and, and then you can, you can also have the similar 3D views uh, of a directional antenna as well. If you see from the XY plane, you look it like this. If you see from the XZ plane, it might look as this. But then if you, if you look from the ZY plane, okay, so in that case, you can see um, like, like a view like this where this is the main lobe and then these are the these are the side lobes okay uh, so depending on which uh, direction you are looking you can see different views of the radiation pattern so moving on with the antenna uh, there are different uh, there are different <clears throat> parameters of an antenna the first thing is the antenna gain so so this is basically um, this measures the directionality of the antenna as well so basically this is the power output in a particular direction compared to that produced in any direction by a perfect omnidirectional antenna so <clears throat> So this is the definition of the antenna gain. Then we also have another parameter called the effective area of the antenna. So this is related to the physical size and the shape of the antenna. And sometimes this effective area um, controls the gain of the antenna. Okay. So, so let's say this is the relationship of the antenna gain. So you can see the gain G is defined as 4 pi times the effective area divided by the square of the wavelength. So you can see that the gain is uh, dependent on both the effective area and also the also the wavelength of the, of the electromagnetic signal. If you write this expression in a different form, then you can write it in terms of the frequency of the signal also and the speed of light okay so so you can see if you have a very high carrier frequency uh, f then your gain increases so let's say if you have high f then your g is also increasing uh, also from the other perspective if you have a high wavelength okay then your gain decreases okay so if your wavelength is high, then your gain is low. And then if you have your effective area, if that is high, then also your gain is high. So, so uh, moving on uh, with the concepts here. So uh, let's, uh, let's look into the spectrum consideration. So when you are uh, propagating a wireless signal through an antenna you are basically using uh, some carrier frequency as you saw here in this expression of gain also so you are you are operating in a in a carrier frequency and then you are also uh, operating in a in a in a spectrum range okay so let's say if you look into the spectrum of your signal so let's say this is your carrier frequency FC or just F uh, and then you have a bandwidth to operate. So this is the entire spectrum of the signal that you are propagating and what spectrum you will be using, what signal power you will be using, what carrier frequency you will be using, what are the different multiple access schemes you will be using, whether you will be using time division multiple access or frequency division multiple access 
or code division multiple access these things are all controlled by regulatory bodies okay so <clears throat> when we say regulatory bodies these are either government uh, of different countries or government owned third party organizations okay so for example in the us you have this federal communications commission or fcc that that regulates the spectrum and and which application will use what part of the spectrum that is governed by this fcc so for example you will have a certain range of spectrum that can only be used by the military then you can use a certain range of the spectrum by uh, by the broadcasting companies then certain range of the spectrum can be used only for mobile applications uh, certain range of the spectrum can only be used for public safety and so on so there are different categories and each of them can use different range of the spectrum for different purposes and that is actually regulated by some regulatory bodies uh, and then you can have different broad categories of spectrum so for example you can have a certain portion of the spectrum that is licensed to industrial scientific and medical usage and those ranges are called ism bands uh, <clears throat> ism bands are used for wlans then for wireless personal area networks and also for internet of things <clears throat> so coming to the next concept uh, the propagation modes so uh, in in every you know uh, wireless communication you can have different propagation modes so for example you can have ground wave propagation you can have sky wave propagation and you can have line of sight propagation so let's see what are those so this slide actually summarizes very nicely what are the different propagation modes. So the first one is the ground wave propagation modes where your signal is parallel to the surface of the earth. Okay, You have the transmit antenna, you have the receive antenna and then your signal follows the curvature of the earth. Uh, and then usually the frequency that is used is below 2 megahertz. For uh, sky wave propagation, your signal gets transmitted and it gets reflected by the ionosphere and the surface of the earth and it follows a zigzag pattern like this to, to reach the receive antenna. And, and for line of sight, you can see that you have a direct path without any obstacles between your um, transmitter and the receiver so literally it's uh, it's line of sight as the as the english word means uh, english sentence means so <clears throat> so moving on uh, these are the follow up slides of what i just explained with those uh, diagrams so ground wave propagation as you just saw, it follows the contour of the earth. Um, then frequencies are up to 2 megahertz. And the example of ground wave propagation is an AM radio. Uh, then uh, in sky wave propagation, as you just saw, uh, the signal gets reflected from the ionized layer of the atmosphere. And the signal can travel a number of hops back and forth between the ionosphere and the earth's surface. And example of sky wave propagation is amateur radio and CB radio. CB radio is a special term meant for citizens band radio. So citizens and okay. So <clears throat> so you can um, you can look up more if you're interested to see what is citizens band um, then the line of sight as as we explained so uh, these are these are used for satellite communication um, and sometimes 
for ground communication where the antennas are you know uh, high enough to have an effective line of sight uh, uh, due to due to refraction so uh, <coughs> so as you saw um, uh, in the case of the line of sight so let's say this is my transmitting antenna and this is my receiving antenna so <coughs> So you have a direct line of sight, then you can also have effective line of sight because of refraction from the earth atmosphere. So you can have a path like this. Okay. So that is what is said here. Um, antennas within the effective line of sight due to refraction. Uh, so <clears throat> the refraction happens uh, because you are... Uh, you, you may have known this, uh, you have studied this before, like electromagnetic wave, uh, they actually undergo refraction because their velocities, uh, they are function of the uh, refractive index of the medium. Or in other words, the velocities are the function of the density of the medium. So when the waves changes medium, the speed changes. Okay, and and the waves bends at the boundary of bit, uh, of different mediums. So <clears throat> in your atmosphere also, like the air which is close to the ground is more dense than the air upwards. Okay, higher up in the atmosphere. So because of that, there is a change in the density, and at some point there will be a refraction because of the change in density okay so that's how your effective line of sight uh, is 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 built up because of this type of refraction okay so the direct ray okay this one this one is called optical line of sight and this one is called the um, effective or radio line of sight and the optical line of sight uh, is 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 uh, is given by this equation where d is the distance between the antenna and the horizon and h is your antenna height okay so so yeah so this is the thing okay so the distance uh, between your antenna and your horizon, so this D, let's say this is my D and this is given by, you know, uh, uh, this formula for optical line of sight. And for effective line of sight, this distance is a little more because of this factor k, okay. So k is the adjustment factor to account for the refraction and a general rule of thumb is k equal to 4 over 3, okay. So, <clears throat> so this, in this diagram you can see that this is the radio horizon and this distance the radio horizon distance okay this distance is a little more than this distance because this distance is 3.57 k h under root of of this and this one is this one is just 3.57 the age under root of that so because of this k factor this distance is higher <clears throat> so maximum distance between two antennas for line of sight propagation is given by then uh, this uh, this formula so where h1 is the height of the first antenna and h2 is the height of the second antenna so so basically, if this is your earth, 
and these are the two antenna so let's say this is your um, imagine that this is my radio line of sight okay so this and then this distance right from here is the radio line of sight for the second antenna okay so the if you have a line of sight between these two antenna which just you know touches the let's say the surface of the earth like this then this is the worst case or limiting case and for this you have the distance between the two antennas is this distance plus this distance okay so these are two are given by these formulas okay so that's why you are getting added them and then you have this formula so <clears throat> there are uh, five basic propagation mechanisms so free space propagation uh, then transmission uh, through a medium or refraction uh, through, uh, at, at, at the boundaries of the media then you can have reflections where the waves you know ref get reflected from different surfaces uh, <clears throat> and then you have diffraction so in that case you have secondary waves behind objects with sharp edges and then finally you have uh, you have scattering okay so <clears throat> this is because of the interactions between the waves and the small objects or rough surfaces okay like let's say dust particles in the atmosphere uh, they get those waves scattered so you know mostly about uh, refraction so so refraction of an electric magnetic wave um, I think you have studied this in high school physics so you have an incident ray and then you have a refracted ray um, so and there is a difference in the refractive indices of these two medium okay so if you are going from a rarer medium to a denser medium then you have the refracted light you know bending towards this normal and the opposite is for denser to rarer medium so again these are <clears throat> recap of basic facts so so because of line of sight you know uh, the wireless uh, the line of sight wireless transmission um, they have some impairments okay so you can have <coughs> attenuation and distortion because of the attenuation you can have free space loss you can have noise you can have atmospheric absorption you have multipath refraction and thermal noise so we will we will go through each of these one by one okay so <clears throat> so the first thing is attenuation so attenuation is nothing but uh, the lowering of the signal strength with distance okay so when the signal propagates through the through the medium through the transmission medium in case of your wireless transmission it's just the air so after it goes a certain distance the signal strength falls actually it keeps falling with distance but after it goes a certain distance it goes below a certain threshold and then you may not be able to detect that signal so that is the attenuation <clears throat> then you have uh, free space loss so free space loss for an ideal isotropic antenna is basically the ratio of the transmitted power and the received power okay so this ratio is given by this formula which you can see is directly proportional to the distance to the propagation distance and also inversely proportional to the wavelength or directly proportional to the frequency of the carrier 
okay so as you go further as your d increases your pt over pr increases what does this mean this means that your pr the received power actually uh, is is very low compared to your transmitted power okay <clears throat> so so basically the point here is as d increases your pr decreases okay and then that is your free space loss and and it is actually decreasing by the square of the distance not just the distance okay and then of course frequency has a part to play so if you have a high frequency signal um, that is that gets attenuated faster than a low frequency signal okay so <clears throat> So free space loss can also be written in the form of uh, this formula. So it can be written in dB where you take the log of this ratio and then multiply it with 10. And this logarithm is to the base 10 by the way. So <clears throat> and, and because of the square term, so Pt by Pr was 4 pi d over lambda square. So because of the square term, uh, it comes in the front of the logarithm. So you can get 20 log of this and then you can simplify further to this expression. So you can see that the loss in dB is, is proportional to the signal's carrier frequency f and the distance d that uh, it, it moves from the transmitting antenna and then some adjustment factor so if you plot the free space loss that you just calculated in db with uh, you know with the distance then you see that the loss increases okay with distance okay the loss always increases with distance and and these are the different plots for different frequencies so you can also see that for lower frequency let's say 30 megahertz the loss is relatively lower the loss is relatively lower uh, than let's say the case of 300 megahertz okay and this pattern follows for higher frequencies so whenever we have a step jump in frequency the the losses are all higher compared to the uh, lower lower uh, frequency cases okay so <clears throat> so moving on uh, uh, with the concept of loss so the path loss exponent as you saw for for free space is uh, like, like two okay so this factor uh, that that was uh, appearing over d the distance was two in case of free space systems, but in practical systems, this is not always two, okay? Uh, because of different uh, different cases like reflections, scatterings, etc. And beyond a certain distance, the received power actually decreases logarithmically with distance. And and this formula, like the value of n. Uh, has been obtained based on many measurement studies and it has been observed that that this doesn't follow a square law dependence uh, as far as the distance is concerned okay so and therefore you have this d to the power n factored out out of this formula and uh, when you write it in terms of decibels, you have this 10 n log d instead of 20 log d. So 
the formula for free space was 20 log d okay so n can have different values based on the environment all right so you if you if you have free space then it's 2 but otherwise it can be let's say 2.7 to 3.5 for urban area for uh, you know <clears throat> shadowed cellular radio this is between three to five so again shadowing means like if there is a big obstacle between your transmitter and receiver then you get shadowed okay so that phenomena is called shadowing and because of that obviously the the loss will be very high and therefore um, the signal power falls rapidly with distance and so the exponent is 3 to 5 here uh, inside a building when you have line of sight this can be lower than 2 this can be 1.6 to 1.8 okay uh, obstructed in between buildings this can go as high as 4 to 6 obstructed in factories you can have 2 to 3 and so on so these path loss models um, they are obtained as as i said a few couple of slides back they are obtained based on some empirical measurements so so you have to you know determine uh, the power levels the height of the towers the height of the antennas etc and then uh, based on all this uh, Japanese scientist Okumura developed a model and then that was later refined by Hata. So this detailed measurement and analysis were done in the Tokyo area and, and these models de developed by Okumura and Hata, these are among the best uh, models for path loss in wireless systems and they they can predict path loss for typical environments like urban areas small and medium sized cities large cities suburban areas and rural areas so this is a class exercise for you um, so let's say for a radio transmission in free space signal power is reduced in proportion to the square of the distance from the source so this is for uh, free space or wireless whereas in wire transmission the attenuation is a fixed number of db per kilometer okay so the following table is used to show the db reduction relative to some reference for free space uh, radio and uniform wire so fill in the missing numbers to complete the table so so for one kilometer of distance the free space radio has a minus 6 dB of loss and for a wear uh, it is minus 3 dB so basically the wear has minus 3 dB per kilometer of loss okay and this one is following the formula that we just showed to you okay so now if my distance increases to 2, 4, 8 and 16 how will this loss evolve and how is this loss for wired systems evolve so uh, apply your thoughts apply whatever you have learned so far uh, pause this video here you can go back and play the previous parts and then try to solve this problem i'm not giving you the answer now uh, it's uh, it's for your practice and then you can come up with the answer to me uh, later and I will validate whether it's correct or wrong okay so let's now move on uh, to the different categories of noise okay so there can be f f these four broad categories of noise uh, the first one is thermal noise then intermodulation noise uh, crosstalk and impulse noise so the thermal noise is mainly uh, due to the agitation of electrons in the in the electrical circuitry of, of your communication system okay in the transmitter and and receiver especially the receiver uh, 
so it's present in all electronic devices and it cannot be eliminated okay it has to be there uh, and usually it's a function of temperature so if, if you are operating in a higher temperature then your thermal noise will be more and this is particularly significant for satellite communication so thermal noise is mathematically expressed as this so the amount of thermal noise to be found in a bandwidth of one hertz is given by n0 equal to k times t where n0 is the noise power density in watts per one hertz of band bandwidth okay and this is k the Boltzmann constant time the temperature in kelvins or the absolute temperature okay so you can see that this is a constant so therefore uh, it's directly proportional to t so more is your temperature higher is your noise power okay and when you are considering a communication system of total bandwidth b then actually the total noise power let's say i denote it as this this will be n0 times b okay so these many watts so you can see that since your n0 uh, <coughs> increases as your t increases therefore your pn also increases as your t increases so <coughs> So exactly what I was saying in the previous slide. So thermal noise present in a bandwidth of B hertz is given by this. And if you want to represent it in decibels, so you can take log of both sides and then you can have this expression. Okay. <clears throat> the other forms of noise uh, are intermodulation noises. So this occurs if the signals with different frequencies share the same medium with non-linearity so so i'm not going into the details of these so this is these are out of the scope of this module so <clears throat> so just remember the definitions okay so crosstalk is the unwanted coupling between the signal paths and the impulse noise is basically the irregular pulses or noise spikes so these are of short duration and of relatively high amplitude okay and these are basically caused by external electromagnetic disturbances so let's say if there is a lightning or thunder okay uh, then you can experience this impulse noise okay <clears throat> so when you measure um, uh, the noise um, and, and, and the signal power and you want to have a relative measure of the signal uh, compared to the noise then you you define it uh, with this expression eb by n0 so basically this is the ratio of signal energy per bit to noise power density per hertz okay so <clears throat> so basically uh, This is uh, <coughs> this is the <coughs> signal energy per bit. Okay, so if you have if you have the bit rate of R, okay, <coughs> then you can express E B as S divided by R. Okay, and then N zero is your N zero, which is K times T times. Uh, I mean k times t and then you can write this eb by n0 as s over k times t times r so <clears throat> so your bit error rate or bit error probability for any digital data is a function of this eb by n0 so this aspect we will we will learn more in more depth and more detail in our digital communication class so right now you just uh, appreciate this fact that your bit error rate eb is directly proportional to eb by n0 or in other words it's a function of eb by n0 
and in your digital communication class you will see that this function is actually a Q function okay and again we will discuss a lot about Q functions in our digital communication class but right now the only thing you you need to know is that if you plot your EB by N0 and your probability of bit error then this PB is a Q function of this EB by N0 and the Q function behaves like this so as you go high with EB by N0 the probability falls sharply like this okay uh, so this is the card that I, I wanted to show you so you have on your x-axis EB by N0 in DB and your probability of bit error in the y-axis and, and and it falls sharply with EB by N0 and let's imagine that you have two systems one has a worse performance let's say you have a bad system and a good system okay so so you have a better performance with the good system and better performance means these curves are sharper okay so or in other words let's say with the same value of eb by n0 let's say we have a point here for which gives a value of eb by n0 and we draw a straight line like this so for the same value of eb by n0 we get a lower probability of error for the good system and a higher probability of error for the bad system okay so the same value of eb by n0 gives me a probability of error which is lower in the y-axis here and for the bad system we are we are here so obviously this value is high this is has a high probability of error so this is a worse performance and this is a better performance again this aspect also we will uh, we will appreciate more when we will study digital communication so with this i'll stop here um, and we'll see you in the next uh, video lecture thank you